Hey everybody, welcome back. We're now going into part two, talking about my life's experiences and my beginnings. If you have not watched part one, then you should do so and then come back for part two. And don't forget to subscribe. Here we go. Okay, you know, when I was watching the last video that you watched, part one, um, there was a scratch right here. Oh, child, we can't, no, was it here? Or was it here? I forget, it was one of these places here, I think. We can't be having those scratches. I don't know how I got that scratch. Maybe I scratched myself, I'm not really sure. And then the microphone was showing. I said, what is all this? But it was not worth me doing it over. Okay, but I have since corrected, put a little makeup on that scratch, and here we go. All right, so we talked about, in the last video, about me smoking. Yes, yeah, she smoked. Yes, yeah, she did. Terrible, terrible, terrible. And in this video, we're going to talk about what smoking did to my vocal folds and also what I did when I decided to change careers and go more into theater and records and that kind of thing and how my style changed, my style of singing changed. So let's go back though to my second year at Juilliard. And I don't know where I was. Uh, I was singing somewhere, I guess. And this lady by the name of Ernestine McClendon came up to me and she says, young lady, I would like to take you to the Apollo Theater to see if I could get you some work. Huh? Listen, I was a classical singer. I didn't know much about the Apollo Theater, but one thing I knew, they were not up on that damn stage singing arias from different operas. I will guarantee you that. But I'm thinking to myself, oh, what the hell? I mean, let's go. Let's see what she can do. So we go to the Apollo Theater, and I met Bobby Schiffman, whose family owned the Apollo at that time, and Honey Coles. Now, Honey Coles, the name you might know, uh, he went on to win a Tony for his role in My uh, my One and Only with Tommy Toon on Broadway. Well, they listened to me sing, and they did say, well, she's gifted. She has a talent, and, you know, we can't put her on the stage right now because she's not singing the kind of music that we do here. But we would like to manage her, and I'm thinking, yeah, okay, that sounds pretty good. So they became my managers. Bobby taught me the business of show business. And honey taught me all about the stage. Now I'm gonna tell you, I'm moving around. You know I don't have no pants on down here. I mean, I have pants on, but you know, they're shorts. But anyway, I'm gonna tell you that as an artist in this business, please, please learn about this business, the business of it so that you will not be taken advantage of because it can happen. Don't be stupid. Do you understand me? Don't be stupid. If you have a manager, don't just give everything to that manager because you think, okay, he's gonna run everything so I can relax and all I have to do is perform. It shouldn't work that way. You wanna know what that manager's doing. You wanna know when he's doing it, how he's doing it. You wanna have a connection with that, man with that manager. It should, it should be a collaboration. Yes, he's gonna find things and present them to you, but no, he should not be able to say, my artist is going to do this without consulting you first. All right? So get in that habit. Know the business of what you are doing. Financially, know how contracts work. Don't go into these shows not knowing about a contract or doing something before you've even signed a contract. <sighs> okay, I have gone off, off, off because these two things are very near and dear to me. Okay, so I just, I don't want you be, to be a stupid performer. I want you to be informed. All right, so Bobby taught me the business of show business and Honey taught me the performance in. When I wasn't in school and studying, they made me watch all the shows that came into the Apollo Theater. And that's basically how I learned. And then, of course, I continued to learn through my experiences what to do, what not to do. When I tell you, <laughs> I saw some of the greatest performers on the Apollo stage. You had Gladys Knight, uh, Diana, Ree, uh, uh, Diana Ross, 
and the Supremes. You have the Temptations, um, the Stylistics, the Commodores, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Cool in the Gang, Maxine Brown, Martha Reeves, and the Vandellas, um, uh, Nancy Wilson. Oh, I'm, I could go on and on. All great performers. And I learned from them. And I'll, I'll share with you mistakes that I did and made because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. But <laughs> we will talk about that in the how-to videos. This is just me just kind of, you know, sharing my life's experiences with you. All right, so now they, uh, you know, they, they became my managers. And they stayed with me for the next few years. Uh, Bobby took me down to meet, oh, I can't think of his name. Was it John Hammond or maybe his brother? or I can't remember. To see if he could get me a deal, a record deal. And to make a long story short, I was eventually signed with Epic Records. Now, let's talk about how I started venturing into other styles. Because I was an opera singer. Child, you can't sing R&B like that. Not in a million, not in a million years. So I was determined that I was going to learn how to belt and sing in these styles and be authentic. I didn't want to sound like a classical singer trying to sing R&B, trying to sing jazz. I, I didn't want to be that. So for the next 10 years, oh God, my vocal folds, oh Lord, they were determined that this was not going to happen. Because I was born a classical singer, I have very, very, very sensitive little cutesy vocal folds. They're, they don't want to know about belting. So I was hoarse all the time. Nodes would pop up on my own. Then I would have to take steroids, go into the doctor and him give me a thing for steroids. I was going through all of this stuff. This went on for 10 years. And at the same time, I was smoking. What? Yes, I was. I was smoking. So, okay, here's how this would go. I would go into the recording studio. And by this time, my voice was sort of, I could, I could manage the style of R&B a bit, but not to what it would eventually become, but it was good. I would go into the recording uh, studio and after three songs, my voice was finished. That was because of cigarettes. And while I was in the booth, laying down the track, I was smoking. Yes, I was. Come on, how stupid could I have been? But still didn't know I was young, honey, and I was still able to sing to a, to a degree. I still had a range to a degree, but my voice would just give out after three songs in the recording studio because we were doing take after take after take. So still wasn't enough to make me stop. So this went on and on and on until Bubbling Brown Sugar came along. Now, before I get into Bubbling Brown Sugar and how that all happened. Let's go back to the Apollo. So now as I'm getting into this other way of singing, Bobby decided he's going to put me on the Apollo stage. Oh heaven, the heaven had opened up. Now at that time I wasn't really singing R&B because you know, let me tell you something. <laughs> let me tell you something. My nose was like this as far as R&B is concerned. What R&B? Oh God, no. I would never sing that kind of music. So I was singing like show tunes, you know, songs from musicals. And I used to sing, Who Can I Turn To? From the roar of the grease paint, smell of the crowd. But I was doing things to that song that had never been done. And I was hitting all kinds of notes and going to the valley on the notes. And so Bobby liked it. So they put me on the stage and the audience loved it, you know, even though I wasn't singing quite what they were used to hearing coming to the Apollo Theater. But I would do several shows at that point from then on at the Apollo. And it was good, all leading to experiences. But let me tell you about this one thing. In the beginning, you know, I used to, I've always been about creating my own arrangements. So I had, uh, there was a song called What the World Needs Now. What the world 
needs now is love, sweet love, Dion Warwick. Well, I had written out this thing. It was like a lead sheet. And when I would start, it was not coming together with when I, where I was coming in. And like, like, it's like we were in two different keys. I didn't know what was going on. So in front of everybody at the Apollo Theater, I stopped, went over to the piano and showed the man what he was doing wrong and this is how it should be done. This is in front of an audience. <laughs> I cannot believe, when I'm talking about it now, I can't believe I did that. Anyway, so when the show was over, baby, oh, honey grabbed me by my elbow and he said, don't you ever do that again. Are you kidding me? So I never did that again. And another thing that I used to do, I used to sing into the wings like there was no audience out front. This was all during the same time. I would go, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing I've been thinking of. I probably sang the wrong word, sang it differently. I can't remember the song. But that's what I used to do. And so Honey came up to me and he said, and by the way, what is there in the wings? I said, what do you mean? He said, you're singing into the wings. I said, no, I'm not. He said, Vivian, you're singing into the wings. He said, the audience is in front of you, not to the right and not to the left. He said, stop it. So I took him at his word that I was singing into the wings. So I stopped that. Anyway, back to the smoking. Well, I did a show called Don't Bother Me, I Can't Cope. And by the time we got to the I don't know, the eighth show of the week, and I had about 10 songs to do. I was barely singing those songs, but still, it wasn't enough to stop me from smoking. So, if you wanna hear what stopped me, stay tuned for the next video. <laughs>